and we're talking here to Meatloaf, and it's uh, great to have you down in the country so excited about this new album. Oh, I am, in, I am truly pumped. Yeah, and uh, Hank Cool Teddy Bear, great title. It and is great. Now, you were talking before, because just to explain to the folks See, the here... See, Australians appreciate the title more than anyone, and I love that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty easy that way. Uh, you know, I mean, we had Humphrey Bear all those years ago on television, so we, oh, that, we, we, that, we have a point it. of reference, yeah. But uh, I guess, you know, like you, you you locked us in the room here and came in and played <laughs> the album to us. I've never had that experience with an artist before. We were a captive audience, folks. I, you see, and I, and I love that, because I... I, I hear a lot about from me. That's the first time I've done that before. It was the first time we've done it. Right, first time. And I, I just love it when you when you can be the first at anything. And now other artists, I've created a monster for mm. other artists. that, they, that And the record companies are going to go, well, Milov did this. And they're going to go, well, yeah. man, I'm going to kill that guy. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know that anybody else will do it. But, you know, I'm doing it. And, and, and uh I have the to me. I have the record to do it with. So. Well, certainly. And you you mentioned that you know the, the the title sort of didn't have a reference in the lyrics, but you know. Oh, I put it in though. Well, the, the Elvis track at the end. I was thinking like immediately uh, before you said that, I thought of Elvis and Teddy Bear, and maybe this is where he's going. Oh uh, no, no, I didn't think of that. I stuck it in the first one in the first song because I wanted to make a reference to it, and and it was uh, the the uh, line that I say is right time, right place, and they say to me. Hang cool, teddy bear. And I, I, I said in a very defiant tone. Mm. You know, it's like some sergeant just said to him, hang cool, teddy. And they say, and I'm sitting here, because the first line of the uh, short story is shrapnel hurts. Mm. There's more pain than I actually realized there would be. Mm. It's, it's a burning. And it all talks about be, having shrapnel in him. Mm. And, it's, uh, and it's a very kind of, the story's kind of graphic, because I... I Said to Killian, we got to make this really edgy. And Killian wrote it and said, Is that edgy enough for you? I went, Yeah, that'll do, Killian. Yeah. And because it talks about his friend, and I, we won't get into that. I'll let you read it. Yeah, but because it is so, so visual, will there actually be an accompanying uh, video or movie that goes well, with we, this? Well, we've got. There's no wireless network. Oh, there's no wireless. Yeah, mm. we, we shot. We shot but, yeah, we shot a video with a Andy Morahan, who is responsible, like November Rain, just one director of the mm. year for NME and. And has won a lot of. I'm sure he's won MTV awards and everything else. Uh, a really good director, and I and I I I made him. I did the same thing with him. Usually, you know, directors they'll get a song and that's all they get. I made Andy come in, and he had to sit and listen to the whole record with me. Mm. I said it's he, he nobody had ever done that to him, <laughs> and I said it's important. You have to understand what's going on here. You have to understand the dynamic that you're dealing with, and you have to understand the power you're dealing with and, and where this guy is. And I said, yeah, because he wrote it just for me to be in the video, and I said, that's fantastic, but we really need uh, Patrick and Jenny, the two characters. Mm. And so I said, we need them stuck in there. And I said, my idea of this, if I'm involved with videos, and it is that it's fire and ice, and I, I'm fire and ice. Uh, and you can take that yin yang, mm. good you know, devil on your shoulder, you know, angel on your shoulder, fire and ice. I call it fire and ice. And and um, so if, if there was you know if the because there's a option for a script at the moment and the record does well, we'll we we'll go that way. I I I won't you know if I'm the video, I'll be a doctor in the hospital somewhere you know going, code code red, <laughs> and uh, because it's not. I'm not the meatloaf is not the central character in here. Patrick is, mm -hmm. and um, so and I, I usually when I do a record, I yeah every song is a different character, and so I take it from that perspective. This record was more difficult because it, it's like if you're the lead in a movie. It's much more difficult to be the lead in the movie than it is to come into a movie and do a couple of scenes, mm. because you can you can have a Two, if you're doing two scenes or three scenes in a movie, you can come blazing in and have this impact and get out. Where if you're the lead, you have to build them, you have to mold them, you have to give them the, the dynamics. You, and it's tough. It's tough doing, you know, having 25, 30 scenes in a film because you can't just blaze in and blaze out. And so that's what I had to do with the album. So I was working with acting coaches and vocal coaches on this thing. Because it really needed to be perfect from my, from that character's point of view. So uh, I really underplayed a lot. We underplayed him. Los Angeles Loser is really underplayed. 
the song with Jack Black, Like a Rose, is not underplayed. The guy's really, he's really pissed off now. Mm. Uh, uh, Living on the Outside is really underplayed at the beginning, and then it's more exciting when he starts talking to, to Jenny to say, look, I know I left and you got married, but, you know, forget all that. Let's get out of here because I got my, because the lyrics is, I got my mama's smile and my daddy's gun and you got your liar's tongue. Let's go. Mm. And, I mean, I love that lyric. That's just the, the the lyrics and once you get involved and you really see what the lyrics are in this record, they're really different than any meatloaf lyrics ever. The closest would be if I can't have you. Mm. Uh, that's the closest to a meatloaf song, uh, you know, the typical meatloaf in parentheses song that uh, that uh, you get you get close to. But you've got various songwriters on here, so to actually tell the story, which this album is from beginning to end, a complete story, did they have to sort of jump in and sort of work on just a part of that story? How did they? Uh, no, I used them all actually. <laughs> I, I I was having um, I, I had Cara, I had Justin Hawkins, I had Rick Brantley, I had Jake Shearer, I had Eric Nally, um, John Bon Jovi. Well, yeah, John, John, John doesn't know. <laughs> no, he has no clue. He, the only thing he knows is it is he asked uh, Rob. He saw Rob and goes, "Did my song make the record?" And Rob goes, "Yes, John, your song made the record. Oh, good." Yeah. And so he doesn't know I changed the second verse or the chorus yeah. or uh, the bridge going into the chorus. You he do goes, now, John. <laughs> yeah, you do now. So he doesn't know that. I didn't change that. That I changed second verse a, a lot. Uh, kind of rewrote the whole second verse and, but um uh and the chorus just flipped a couple and changed a couple of lines inside but but i'm i do that i i did that with steinman so mm. it's not unusual for me to change lyrics mm. and they go well you're singing the wrong lyric no i'm singing the right lyric for the character mm. um that, that so they can never argue with me on that if anytime it's the character's correct you can't argue because it is a story will you uh, have to perform the song I, I, songs in order live? Uh, you know what i i I, I really would I really would love to but what that's going to entail is that they would have to be the uh, an audience that buys tickets would have to know what they were getting into mm. because an audience that that's not educated is going to expect to hear bad is going to expect to hear anything for love going to expect to hear you know what they consider to be the hits and you, it's not fair to to someone to to pay money without them actually really comprehending what they're buying um, it's like false advertising kind of deal, you know. It's like uh, mm. they get you in a store and then tell you, "Oh, I'm sorry, we're all out of that one." Mm. But we've got this one. It's only six hundred dollars more. Um, yeah, I would love to, and I have a great idea for it. Uh, uh, I have a friend of mine who is going to read the short story for me, who's a really brilliant actor. Uh, I mean, I could do it, but it's going to be better if someone else reads it. Uh, and and he's got a great voice for it, and um, so I ha- I have an idea for that show, and I might put that up, but it would be a really limited kind of thing. I mean, yeah, it'd be really limited. So we will do. I will try to do as much of this in an order live before we get into the old stuff. I have way. I have all kinds of ideas to do everything. I always do though. Mm. But but that's my thing is to sit around and think. You've got some amazing people working with you on this record, and one of those people is your daughter, Pearl. Well, Pearl's not actually on the record. Pearl, there's a, there's another song that will be a, a, in the movie, and he he basically, this the song is whether if Killian allows him to actually die, Killian Kerwin, who wrote the short story, the song is is sung with myself and Pearl, and Patrick is a ghost. Uh-huh. Patrick sings it as a ghost, and it's called Boneyard. And, the, and he's singing, go ahead and bury my bones. If you're coming with me, you're going six feet down. Mm. And Pearl just sings along the harmonies on it. It'll be a bonus track on iTunes. <laughs> and uh, not really a fan of iTunes. Not because I don't think it's good that people can get music, and I love that idea. It's just that it has changed the face of the music industry into into not having albums and not being creative. I mean, there's still people out there, obviously, Radiohead, Springsteen, Kid Rock, you know, um, I, I, there's, a, in, there's an endless amount of us, but there's an also, a, if you look at the charts, a lot of them, it's all about, they don't care about the art of the music. They care about 
the fact that when they walk down the street, some paparazzi guy is going to take their picture. And the last thing I want is some paparazzi guy to take them. Go away, please. I'll be nice to them and let them take the picture. But I, I, I'm not really into that. Yeah. Now, uh, Hugh, Hugh Laurie on here. Yeah, Hugh, you know, I, I had no idea that he could really play piano until I'm shooting the episode of House. And, I mean, I've heard about his band in Hollywood, but mm. I, I thought it was like the golfers, you know, the, the pro golfers have a band, too, and it's not that good. So I didn't, I didn't know. And uh, when I'm shooting House, we sh- you shoot over a two-week period. And uh, one Monday night, another episode of House was on, and I was home. I was watching on TV at the end of it. They let him play piano for almost a minute and a half. I would think maybe two minutes, he'd just sit there and play piano. And I went, well, he can really play. Well, I wonder if he's interested in playing. And I had this really great song that was just piano and voice. It was very short, but piano and voice. And I thought, you know, it'd be spectacular for Hugh to play. And I, and I, but that song didn't make the record. <laughs> so I handed him the song, and that's, I, I didn't give it to him. I gave it to his assistant with a little note. And I was never going to bother him again because there's nothing worse than going up going, Hugh, did you get the song? What'd you think? How do you think? You want to play? I mean, you just don't do that to people. I mean, that's like obnoxious and real. You know, I did it to Spielberg and I, I came up, well, you got to put me in your movie, Stephen. <laughs> and so I've never done one, you know, because I was an obnoxious little prick. And uh, so I've learned my lesson from that one. And uh, so I didn't say anything. And, and that was on uh, like a Tuesday and on a Wednesday morning. I show up on the set and I walk on the set about 8.30. And he comes running over with his arms spread, going, I'd love to. <laughs> so I went, fantastic. And we just changed, exchanged emails. And, and it took about, <laughs> I don't know, almost nine months after that to get him, to actually get him there. And I kept changing songs on him. And, and then when he came in, he was really nervous. But I, loved, I love Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie's a real guy. Yeah. And Jack Black's in there as well. Jack. Jack is in. I, all these people that are on here are just real people. You know, they don't care whether the blue horse is there or not. Mm. Yeah. Or if yeah. they're driving on Michelin instead of Goodyear. Okay, I think we... Uh, I know. We, uh, uh, one wait, more. Wait, go, go, we're go. being wound up. Yeah, I got it. They always wind up. They always do that to me. But I always go, just go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, just oh, one oh, more. I'll just throw in a personal question then because the... Uh, the oh, free, no, do, the, no, no personal. No, What's personal, the personal? Personal for me. When I oh, first personal heard, for you. Yeah, Fine. when I first heard uh, Meatloaf was uh, on the uh, Free For All album, Ted Nugent, all those years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was that was quite... You know you know what? They owe me a fortune for that record. I bet. How did that come about? I always want to know how it came about. Oh, I'm going to... I'll tell you exactly how that came about. They and 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 I bet they don't owe me a fortune because they they I at the time I really had no money and they said we'll give you a thousand dollars to come and sing the lead vocals on this thing and I went a thousand dollars really okay and um, I did all those vocals in two days I could never do it now but two days but what they sent me all they sent me were lyric sheets and tracks. There was no reference vocal, there was no melodies, there was no anything. So I went in, all of those melodies are mine. I, when the songs, when I, I, I get in there and I go, do you have any idea how long it is till the vocal comes in? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's eight bars, it's two bars, it's four bars, okay. So I have to wait four bars, I'd start a vocal. And, and the producers, there was two producers, and they argued, and they argued, and they argued. They didn't like what I was singing here. They didn't like this melody. And I eventually went to them after about three hours, and the drummer that was on the record was in there. And I said, why don't you guys do this? Why don't you leave, and you come back in two days from now? I will have the vocals done, and what you don't like, we'll do over. I said, leave. I can't remember his name. I said, leave him with me, and we'll get it done. And they said, what? I said, get the fuck out of here. And so they did. In two days, they came back, and they loved the vocals, and that was that. Great classic album. Check it out, folks. Uh, free for all. Ted My favorite Nugent, song on that again. is called Hammer Down. Hammer Down was a, yes. Yeah. And Very there's another song. There's another one where I'm, I, I think I hit the high, I know, i got to stop. I hit the <laughs> highest note I've ever hit on a record on this one song. Meatloaf, good to have you here at Undercover. No problem.